I'm um, going to talk about how to write C++ that's safe for some definition of safety. And um, the general idea is uh, what, what, what is safety, what kind of safety are there, what do we need? Uh, that's the first quarter. Then I'm going to show you that we've been creeping up on that uh, for a few decades. It's part of the initial aims of C++. Then I'm going to talk about how to write good contemporary C++ under the label of the C++ core guidelines. And then I'm going to talk about profiles, which is about how to guarantee uh, safety because guidelines and being careful is not sufficient in all areas. Um, so one of the reasons uh, there's so much talk about uh, safety is that uh, parts of the US government uh, started uh, going on about safety, which is quite reasonable, but uh, they, they're talking about the whole community, which may or may not be true, and they're talking about the mythical language C, C++, um, which I have something to say about. Anyway, you can look it up. This is a serious concern that we have to deal with. On the other hand, there's not, uh, no reason to panic. Uh, C++ is, is doing well in uh, general thing. I mean, TOB measures noise, not usage. But, so these numbers doesn't show precisely anything. But it does show that uh, maybe a billion or two people depend on what we are doing, so we better do it well. Uh, so we, we have to address the, the safety issue. It's, it's a real serious problem. I mean, I, I really don't want my brakes not to work when I press it, if I had a car. Um, and. Uh, there, there are other things, if you're in finances, you, you don't want a, uh, a transaction to disappear, especially when it went, if it was going into your account. And so um, th there's a, a lot of aspects of this. And uh, the interesting thing is that massive improvements really is, impo uh, is possible in a lot of areas. Um, one of my messages in this talk is don't write C slash C++, uh, write C++. Um, we can do much, much better than some of the problems that has been documented. And um, well, if we don't do it, somebody else will tell us what to do and we'll like that even less. Um, so ignoring safety issues would hurt the community and uh, offering guaranteed safety will be in the best tradition of C++. So this is actually an opportunity. I mean, uh, don't, don't let a, uh, a problem uh, stop you from doing something good. So um, the idea of complete type and resource safety was in C++ from the beginning. Uh, Simula uh, was one of the uh, completely safe languages except for the bugs. I was pretty good at breaking it. Uh, but one thing that we know is that we couldn't have complete safety um, with the hardware we had then and we can't now for all languages and for all uses, but being careful doesn't scare. So we have to use uh, judicious programming techniques supported by library, enforced by language rules and analysis, and um, I, I wrote up a basic model for how to do that a few years ago. I actually presented it here, but not much happened. Um, we need it to be C++. That is, there shouldn't be restrictions on what we can do, uh, even though there might be restrictions on how we do it. And there shouldn't be any decline in performance. Uh, this is C++, and actually, some of the techniques for writing safe codes improve performance. Um, there, I'm talking mostly about what can be done by a compiler and static checking because it is free or actually gives improvements in performance. But of course, you need range checking to deal with things that cannot be, be dealt with statically. And so basically, I'm talking about type and resource safety. Um, 
And I think this is pretty well defined. Every object is accessed according to the type with which it was defined. That's type safety. Uh, and every object is properly constructed and destroyed. Uh, resource safety. Uh, you can manage resources that way. Uh, if you don't initialize things, then you're breaking some rule. And every pointer either points to a valid object or is a null pointer. That's memory safety. Uh, that's harder to achieve, but we can do it. And a reference through a pointer is not through the null pointer. That is, we have to check for null pointers before we go and dereference these uh, valid pointers. Um, and access uh, through a subscripted pointer is in range. That requires a runtime check, and I'll get to that. So basically, this is just what the rules require. You read the, uh, the standard, and that's what it requires. Read uh, Dennis Ritchie's 45-page uh, uh, C manual from uh, 78. That's what it requires. It's just we haven't been doing it. And so the rules I'm putting forward here are, are more deduced than invented. They are deduced for what it takes to do what's on this slide. And um, enforcement rules that I'm suggesting are mutually dependent. You can't just take one thing out of context and expect to get uh, easily specified uh, benefit out of it. Uh, you, you have to have a framework for what you are doing to see what you are planning to get out of it. And um, C++ still has to serve a, a wide variety of users and areas. We, we have millions of users and and uh, billions of uh, people relying on us, and one size doesn't fit all. We can't just say, this is, this is what safety is, everybody do it this way. Um, that, that, that doesn't quite work. C++ is also a systems programming. We uh, manipulate hardware in various ways. We use unusual hardware that uh, is, is, is not known in the language specification. And we can't outsource this uh, to other languages. A lot of the so-called safe languages outsource all the low-level stuff to C or C++. So if we couldn't do it, uh, well, there would be C left. Uh, and basically, but somebody has to do the dirty job here. And we can't break billions of lines of existing code. I say can't, not shouldn't, because we can't. If we try, people will use the old compilers, they will go to a different subset, they will just ignore us. This, this can't be done. Uh, and we can't upgrade the uh, millions of developers uh, quickly. It takes uh, a long time. I keep bumping into people who learn C++ from videos and books that are 10 or 20 years old. I mean, it's tragic, but uh, they could have, it could have been so much easier and the result could have been so much better if they had up-to-date uh, materials teaching up-to-date uh, C++. But getting a whole community like this, like this to move forward is much harder than, than most people ima uh, imagine. Okay, these are difficulties, but we must improve and we can. So the challenge is, is to describe what we mean by type safe C++ use, no violations of the static type system, no resource leak. If, if a system leaks a resource, memory, uh, locks, file handles and such, I, I wouldn't consider it safe because I can crash it with the equivalent of a, a denial of service attack or I could just be sloppy and it crashes when it runs out of resources. So I'm very keen on resource uh, safety. And this is actually one of the things that came into C++ on in the first two weeks. And uh, we have to convince developers to do this. There's a lot of belief out there that if you do grubby, complicated, low-level stuff, it must be faster. And furthermore, I can write this grubby, low-level, complicated stuff to know how smart I am. This does not work. Uh, we, we have to raise the level of, of programming and get this to work at scale. I mean, if I have a class of students, I can get them to do what I tell them to because otherwise they get a bad grade. 
If you are a manager, you can get people to write code the way you like it to, otherwise uh, they don't get their pay rise or they get fired. But at scale, we actually have to convince people. They have to believe it's true. And so that's an important thing. And stability over decades matters. I mean, the only reason people will believe that the code they write today will run in 10 years is that the code that was written 10 years ago runs today. Um, and safety is not just type safety. Uh, I think most of the areas I see are logic errors. I have seen uh, less than um, an equal uh, where uh, uh, greater than was uh, expected and the cost was very large. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you want to prove that the program does what it exactly does, you get a, a very restricted language. Uh, there's uh, some ADA, ADA uh, code that goes in that direction. Resource leaks, I mentioned that concurrency errors. Um, we are doing a lot of concurrency to be able to scale our problems and such, and we have to make sure that this works. You could consider any uh, concurrency error a uh, type violation because uh, the, the, an object wasn't used in its proper way, but it's well worth separating it out so that you can analyze and address it directly. Uh, memory corruption, we just have to eliminate that. Uh, type errors, um, if you use low-level code with a lot of casts and uh, void stars and, and other um, tricky stuff like that, void star star, even worse, um, we have to avoid that. And timing errors, if a response is needed in, um, say, uh, 1.2 mi uh, milliseconds, then um, that's... That's not, if, if, you, if you are not on time, it's not good enough in a lot of real-time control applications. And uh, allocation on predictability, um, there's a ban on, uh, on the use of the free store in, um, in, in flight software. You cannot allocate something uh, after the engine starts, and you can't deallocate something at any point because you might get uh, fragmentation and stuff like that. This means that separately managed chunk of memories are very important in C++. All the significant applications have something on the side where they manage their memory themselves. Uh, the vector is the first and simplest example. We are all using that. It actually takes a chunk of memory and manages it for you. Uh, and then termination errors. I've dealt with uh, systems where termination is not acceptable. Now, if you have, say, 40,000 processes, you have to take into account that something will crash roughly every day or at least every week. And therefore, you can have a strategy that says, well, if a processor has a problem, just crash it because we have written our software to make it to work. But what if there's not such an extra thing? What, what if you're not allowed to crash? A friend of mine pointed out that he was programming um, scuba controllers. There's only one processor in them. Uh, no, crashing is not an option. Some financial systems, legally, you can't crash because you could lose a transaction, and that's not allowed, legal. So um, there's many things here. I'm sure you could find another slide or half a slide of examples of this kind of thing, we have to be able to say, what is it we're trying to do? We're not trying to do everything everywhere because that is not necessary for a lot of people. And anyway, it's not feasible on the scale we are talking about. So security is also not memory safety. There's been some confusion in places between security and um, and, and safety, type safety. Type safety is not security. Um, I was at a security uh, course at uh, Bell Labs many, many years ago. The first class was lock picking. The second class, you are not allowed to use your badge to get into the building. If I can get your computer, all your backup tapes, uh, all your memory sticks, I've got your stuff. 
Um, spies, inside attacks. Um, there's, if you're a large organization, you have pre people that can be bought or uh, idealistic for something that's not the company's thing. Uh, spear phishing apparently works very well. Door rattling. If you try enough places, people have not done the right thing. Denial of service, SQL injection, uh, corrupted input data. So if you want to attack something, you always attack the weakest link. I was told, how do you avoid getting your car stolen at New York Airport? The answer is, park next to a nicer car. Um, so what I'm pointing out, I'm talking about type safety and memory safety and things like that. But don't confuse it with security. Security is a system property. And the system involves computers, people, storage areas, physical things, lots of stuff. I'm not talking about all of that, but remember it if somebody comes and, and, and screams security uh, because you could have a bug in your program. Uh, languages are not safe. Um, like that thing of writing uh, less than instead of greater than and such. And all uh, safe general purpose languages have escape clauses. You have to access hardware resources. You have to improve efficiency of key abstractions. Doing a safe linked list implementation is very, very hard if you want it to be verified safe. I think we're up against the holding problem, but let, let, let's say it's just uh, close to impossible. So there's things that we want to, to do, and we have to use the techniques that, um, that, that are not verifiably safe. And then you have trusted uh, code segments that works. Those are trouble spots, of course but also libraries, uh, code written under less strict rules. You have to call something. How about the operating system? That's written in C. Um, you can't verify uh, the, the operating system for that reason. It's far too complicated. And often the escape clause is C++, so we can't just close all unsafe areas. Um, being safe where it matters, having it guaranteed where it matters, and preferably uh, by default is, is really good. And so pointing out that uh, you can't get absolute safety is not an excuse for ignoring safety issues. It is an argument for focusing our efforts to where we can actually make progress. Um, so I'm going back in history. Um, one of the reasons I uh, started with C++ was I wanted to deal with uh, hardware and I wanted to abstract from it so that I could write better code. And static type safety was the idea. I've been written, writing in languages that were statically safe for a while, including Simula, which is the root of uh, a lot of the uh, higher level stuff in C++. We had classes, uh, encapsulation, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but it's an elusive ideal uh, because sometimes we need progress, sometimes we need better um, progress in what we understand, sometimes we need better uh, hardware. So um, efficient use of hardware, that's where C is. Uh, Manage complexity, that's where uh, Simula is. And I've been trying to move us more towards the Simula area where we can afford it, where we can do it. Okay, so. Uh, when I started, um, if you wanted to call a square root, uh, you could crash the machine. Square root of two would crash the machine, if you are lucky. Otherwise, it just give you a bad result. The point was that uh, the compiler had forgotten that you required a double, and it wasn't converted. So one of the first things I did was to make sure that such things didn't crash. Uh, since crashes are considered a safety problem, you could say that I started on this uh, right away. Um, actually, it was very interesting in the context of tightening up the language today was that I got 10 years of trouble out of uh, that little fix. I mean, even C today uh, is, is, is like that, but it was controversial. Do, do you mean I have to look at the declaration to see what it means? I can't just look at the code? That was an argument I heard a lot. It's incompatible, so 
whenever people didn't like C++, C++ classes, whatever, in the early days, they, they pointed to, oh, it's incompatible. It, it, it's, it's different. Uh, you, you haven't done your job right. Well, I couldn't uh, get my type safety without uh, having an incompatibility. And one thing I've learned is people, when they want to not use a language like C++, they pick something and says, oh, it doesn't do that. Today it is safety, it's not safe. Um, okay, but anyway, it was essential, the type checking, overloading, user-defined types, consistent linking, type-safe linking, all of these things require that the language supported argument checking properly. Fine, so sometimes you just have to do it, it's important. And I think we'll get to that again on uh, safety issues. And basic idea was to represent things in code and uh, create uh, abstractions that you could use that make your code um, simpler and actually safer. Vector string, file handle, concurrent task, message queues, da 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 da. Unfortunately, they're not all standard today, but most of them are. Things take time. I think if we want to address safety, we need abstractions that support uh, that notion. And immutability came in early. Um, const. Uh, I, I felt I needed it. I was coming out of operating systems and things like that, and I knew that those things that couldn't happen, things that I didn't want to happen if I had const, constant. Um, actually, what I really wanted was read-only and write-only, but um, I, I talk to the C guys and they would take const, they wouldn't take read only and write only. We would have been better off with that, but fine. Um, basically, you can do literal uh, constants and you can do interfaces this way. That way we get better interfaces. That's also something that keeps going on. Uh, RAII, um, this was in the first two weeks, have a uh, constructor that constructs the object, initializes the object, uh, establishes the invariant of the object. Uh, if nothing else, if you have encapsulation, you need it. If you don't have encapsulation, you still need it to be able to think, think about your code. And then when you are finished, if it has acquired uh, resources, you uh, have to give them back again. Otherwise, you have a resource leak. Uh, any librarian can tell you that, that people will take out books and they'll forget to give them back again. It's a sort of human nature, and uh, we have to do these things at scale, so re resource release has to be automatic. And uh, it was phrased rather uh, differently in those days because I hadn't invented the terminology, but today we, we have it, and I hope um, we are all using it. Uh, examples of uh, non-memory resources I have there, file handles, locks, sockets, sh shaders, uh, things like that. Okay, so basically here is an example of a resource leak. This is naive, unsafe code, and I used to see it a lot. People open a file, they acquire uh, the, the file, the file handle, they use it and they get out again. And Code is not actually that nice. It's sometimes two pages long, and there's a return statement or a long jump or a exception in that use F, and you never get to the F close. So we, we, we need to not have such code. All the compiler sees, all the analysis uh, that we see, all that the programmer sees is that a fun at a point that comes out of a function and the manual says it has to be given back to another function. This, this is not uh, good code, and it was a source of bugs. And so what we do is represent things directly in code. Uh, I talk about a resource. It should be in the code. Whoops. Did I? Huh. Strange. Um, out of order. Um, anyway, so... Uh, Object-oriented programming came out of similar, well-defined interfaces, classes, abstract-based classes, overloading, all that kind of stuff. That's um, um, all Johan Dahl in the funny uh, checkered jacket and uh, 
Christ knew go in the, uh, the other jacket. He was the one that invented inheritance and basically object-oriented programming. And, but where? Uh, I lost the slide that showed how to uh, handle the file handle thing. Obviously, you create a file handle class, and its destructor uh, closes the file. Um, problem solved. And uh, we should just do more of that. So the evolution of the language, of course, continued. Uh, templates allowed us to have compile uh, time selection of, implementa of implementations. And we finally got concepts, so we have precisely defined interfaces. We really should use those um, consistently. If I, if I had a time machine, I would go back and tell me about concepts back in AG8 and we would have had much better templates and I would have had an easier time deciding and implementing them. Uh, containers, so that we don't have to fiddle with arrays and pointers, and it enables range checking. There's enough information available to range check. Containers and the major implementa implementations have range checked uh, vectors. Unfortunately, there's not a standard for it. and You can't just walk up to a computer and without doing anything else, gets range checking. That's sad, I think, and relevant in the context of safety. And algorithms, we had the traditional STL begin end stuff, and now we can actually just sort the vector or any container. And that again means that there's bugs you can't make, like you can't uh, sort from end to begin or things like that. It gets simpler, it gets clearer and uh, safer. And smart pointers we can use but uh, there are still pointers. Um, so we have range, four, and spans. Uh, the, the loops, the C-style loops there uh, are sort of suspect. Um, I mean, is n really the number of elements there? Um, and uh, you, you can't range check it because the, from the language point of view because there is not enough information in the pointer to be able to do range check. Uh, now we have span that, uh, that knows the size. We can range check where it's needed or it can just do the whole thing, like in that example there. I'll again point out that Dennis, Richie, and I was discussing this problem back uh, in, the, in the 80s and he wanted fat pointers that was span. Uh, so did I, but it took us some time to get it. This is not I mean, if Dennis had been in control of C, we would have had this 20 years ago. Oh, and here was the slide that had disappeared. I will put it in the right place, but basically you solve the problem by having the appropriate abstraction that does the appropriate checks and releases the appropriate resources. Fine. Better late than never. Um, Okay, so uh, I wrote up the ideals for C++, and basically uh, one of the first things is no implicit violations of the static uh, type system. Um, and uh, those are quite a few things there. The point is this has been documented for a while. This, when, when, when I'm talking about safety and safer things and higher level, it didn't start yesterday. It's the best tradition of the language. And uh, benefits comes from using the language well. Uh, use the facilities we're talking about here and avoid uh, raw pointers that you're supposed to delete and owning raw pointer. Don't subscript a raw pointer because you don't actually know what the range is. Uh, and don't dereference a uh, raw pointer before you check whether it points to something. Don't have uninitialized variables, it's so daft. Uh, and you can do it. Uh, that book there, which I wrote for beginners in 2001, I think, it doesn't show any pointers and arrays until chapter 17 after I show them how to do graphics. This can be done. The good C++, the higher level C++, is a consistent set of features. You don't actually have to go and fiddle with the low-level stuff till you really, really need to. You can write perfectly good code, perfectly good applications without going down there. 
And so if you want uh, say C++, don't write C, C++. There's no such language. But there certainly are uses where you would think people had it. They, they say it's C++ and they, they do all the things I said on the previous slides that you shouldn't. And uh, they avoid the higher level stuff, usually claiming performance uh, problems and uh, it's, they don't measure. Um, I teach sometimes graduate students and they still don't know how to measure stuff. And they still talk about efficiency. This, this shouldn't happen. So anyway, we have to evolve our style towards what's provably safe. Because provably safe is the, the, the easiest thing to deal with. It's easiest things to, to, to think about. And uh, as usual, I'm trying to talk people into it. Uh, it has its limits. So being careful doesn't scale. We have to formalize, uh, formalize formulate the rules for safe use. Uh, we have to... Um, provide ways of verifying that people actually do what they are trying to do. I mean, I don't think anybody here, uh, I'm not excluded, that hasn't written a piece of code and they thought it did something and it didn't. I would say it happens, uh, well, probably every week to me. Uh, that's why I like compilers. Um, and we have to articulate the guidelines so that we can um, so, so that we can understand what we're saying. Long, long lists of complicated rules or Greek letters is actually not going to be easy to follow. Uh, and then we have to enforce the guidelines where needed. For what, where, where needed means we have to say, this is what I want here in my code. We'll get to that. So the state of affairs is that if, essentially everything what I describe in the past, and what I will describe in the rest of the talk, has been tried, and many at scale. For instance, range checking, strings, vectors, and span. But nowhere has it all been integrated into a consistent, coherent whole. And that's what I'm arguing we should do. Um, much of the work uh, is, is uh, you know, uh, that I'm talking to you is uh, influenced by the work on the core guidelines. But we have to go uh, further than the guidelines. As I said, uh, being careful uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't scale. And the aim is still guaranteed type and resource safe C++. And then other things too. This type and resource safe is pretty fundamental, but there's other things we want. And therefore, we have to specify what these other things are. And a lot of stuff can be uh, done today. We, we don't have to go and wait for a new uh, release of the standard or something like that. And this is not just about safety. I have seen code speed up by going to a higher level, by expressing more clearly what should be done. If I can understand what's going to be, uh, happen, what should be done, so can the optimizer. And quite often, uh, you get benefits. One of my best ways of uh, debugging and speeding up things these days is to rip out the complicated stuff. And uh, the, what is left, uh, the optimizer can do a good job on. Oops. What is it? OK. Uh, C++ core guidelines. Or oh, just for information, that is the machine that makes your high-end uh, uh, chips, high-end processors, essentially all of them. And of course, it's programmed in C++. Uh, they contacted me to see if I could help them hire good C++ programmers. No, I'm not in that business. But really good C++ programmers can do really interesting things. General strategy. Um, we rely on static analysis to eliminate potential errors. And this is impossible for general code. It's easy enough to write a piece of code that cannot be proven to be correct. And global static analysis is just unaffordable uh, scale. So basically, we need rules to simplify what we are writing to something that can be analy an analyzed uh, efficiently and, and cheaply, local static analysis. And there are some analyzers for, um, for the core guidelines that does things like that. And then provide libraries to make relying on these rules feasible. If, 
if we had to do everything at the language level, uh, things get slow and unpleasant to write, and then we won't do it. With the right abstractions, with the right uh, libraries, just about everything becomes, um, becomes pleasant. Okay, uh, there's a philosophy here. This is a slide I made, I don't know, almost 10 years ago. I highlighted a few things in red. Statically type safe, can be checked at uh, compile time, don't leak resources, prefer immutable data. All of this is safety related. So again, this is in the best tradition of C++ and raising the level of, um, of the writing. And then there's low level rules that we use to implement uh, these ideals. So basically, we state what we want, and then we make long lists of rules that allows us to approximate getting that. Um, and that's the low level things. Um, yeah. And the strategy of the uh, core guidelines and of the uh, profiles that I'm going to talk about uh, next is the observation that simple subsetting doesn't work. If you want to subset C++ to something safe or something elegant or something whatever, the first thing you have to get rid of is uh, subscripting uh, raw pointers and uh, explicit memory management without any implicit releases from destructors. Well, if you take that away, you can't build just about anything. So what you do instead is you build some better abstractions. Uh, vectors, smart pointers, uh, file handle classes, things like that. And once that is done, you can then cut away a lot of the uh, complicated and dangerous stuff at the bottom. Um, this strategy seems to work. We use the STL, the standard library, of course, and then there's a small support library, uh, GSL. That was, by the way, where, um, where span came from. And a lot of people still use GSL span because it's guaranteed range checked. And, um, but the point is we add no new language features. I want the result of using all of this to be ISO standard C++. I don't want to design a new language. It's too hard work, and it takes too long. I want to write code, good code now. So what we want is C++ on steroids, uh, not, not some, some pitiful uh, subset. OK, and so we can actually, um, OK. If I had 10 hours instead of one and a bit, I could go through this list and argue that we can do all of that. Of course, there's not time to this. This is a keynote, not a deep technical dive. So we can eliminate un uninitialized variables, range errors, null pointer dereferencing, resource list, and uh, dangling references. We can do more things, unions, use variants, uh, casts. Just don't do them. Overloading and template programming eliminates most costs if you do it right. Underflow and on overflow, I have not worked my, out myself uh, on that there, but I showed you a picture of an engine earlier. There was a marine diesel engine. It was so big that if you look carefully, you could see the engineer by cylinder head number five. Um, and that is run by some generic programming that checks for underflow and overflow. So it can be done. Uh, I just don't have a specific proposal for it. And we have some uh, ways of dealing with data races. But that takes a whole day, at least. So that's it. Uh, uninitialized variables, I mean, just do it. There's many clever ways of having delayed initialization that act like um, like initialization, but the code becomes brittle and it becomes hard for the human to see uh, what is going on, even if the uh, compiler have no problems with it, making sure that every object is properly initialized. I'm in favor of just initialize everything. There's one exceptional case at least, probably more, which is a huge buffer 
And if you're doing low latency stuff, you don't want to initialize the buffer first and then fill it with good stuff second. Then you've just doubled the time for filling that buffer. I can think of quite a few industries where you would need to be able to have the escape clause from the initialization rules where you can mark things. This one is uninitialized. So it stands out in the code so you can uh, check it and things like that. Um, a lot of these rules to become realistic, you have to have some kind of escape clause and you have to have it explicit so that the humans and the static analyzers can understand what, what is going on. Um, range checking, of course I want range checking. Um, I don't want subscripting of individual pointers. Um, if you are writing C style code, you should be horrified. But uh, we can do without it. Uh, vector and span are the two ex uh, main examples where the range checking can be done and sometimes is being done uh, simply because there's sufficient information available to do the check. With a pointer, there isn't. We have to trust that we have checked thing, the ranges correctly and sometimes we don't get it right. So it's much better to, to use the abstraction for it. Range 4 is really nice. Uh, it uh, eliminates a lot of the uh, static checking because you only have to check the beginning and the end. Um, algorithms are good. I had a bunch of students do some measurements of loops uh, two weeks ago. They were really deeply shocked. Uh, for each and accumulate, uh, beat their hand-coded C-style loops. Huh. Noticeably. But you should have seen my students. Okay. And, and rightfully so. They've been told low-level stuff is important and efficient so often. Null point of dereferencing. Uh, it's fairly easy to check that uh, you, you have uh, a non-null pointer. There's an abstraction in the GSL there uh, for it. Or you could have the an static analyzer check that there is a test close enough to, uh, the, um, to, 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 to the use that you can verify that it's been done. Uh, again, I don't want analyzers to be overly uh, clever because I want to understand it too. Uh, no resource leaks. Be consistent with uh, using abstractions that follow the RAII. Uh, we have a whole bunch of them. Uh, a naked new is a code smell, don't have it. A naked delete is uh, the same, don't have it. Not an application code. They belong in, uh, in implementations of abstractions. And um, I see a fair amount of code like this. Uh, mostly from people coming in from, uh, from Java and uh, C-sharp, where you have to say new uh, to get a user, um, to, to get a, a, an object of a user-defined class. So you have a gadget there. I don't know what's inside the gadget. It may grab locks, it may grab file handles and things like that. And then you write some code, and then you have to remember to delete it, delete it. And people quite real says, well, I don't want to have to write that delete. But they say, I want my garbage collector. But the garbage collector is not going to help you because of what was inside the gadget. You don't know what it is. Uh, it may be something that has to be explicitly freed. And that code, of course, can either throw and get out uh, not getting to the delete, or it can uh, return perfectly ordinary stuff. This has nothing to do with exceptions, uh, though I love exceptions, and they're really good for this kind of stuff. You can get into the trouble without having that. Um, and so re resource handles, we uh, use a lot of uh, unique pointers and uh, shared pointers these days, and that sort of solves the problem. Uh, we are now guaranteed that uh, the destructor is called and things are properly released. Um, simple and cheap, but, but you know, it's still a pointer and it still uses the free store. There's allocations. So what really we should do is more uh, local objects. Uh, there everything works uh, without added notation and added um, 
added allocations. Of course, if you're writing code for an embedded processor with very limited uh, stack space, you have to be careful about this. But in, in general programming, and actually in most programming, this is what's preferred. So uh, it's, it's not just this that should make you worried, but you see the, uh, the, 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 the naked new and analyzers easily warn you against that. But you should also be a little bit suspicious about the, um, the, the smart pointers because they're really inelegant. Um, okay, so dangling pointers. You really have to eliminate dangling pointers. There's all kinds of bad things that can be happen with a dangling pointer. You can write through it into somebody else's memory. You can read from it and get some garbage data. Um, you, you can scramble uh, things. This is really bad. And by pointer, I mean anything that directly refers to an, uh, an object. I mean, this, this could be a smart pointer if you're allowed to them to dangle. It could be references, uh, uh, you name it. And we have to eliminate them. We can eliminate them with a combination of rules and by assuming that raw pointers are not uh, owners so that we don't have to get interference from the memory management problems here. Okay, so here is a piece of code that's not okay. Uh, it looks uh, innocent. I get a pointer and I delete it. Well, under the rules I'm crafting, that is a naked new and the analyzer will reject it. And that is good because when you see G, it makes something, uh, an object, it passes it to F and then it uses it. The use down there is a, um, is a use of a dangling pointer. And of course, in a real piece of code, uh, the void f of x is not visible like that. It's probably on some li uh, library somewhere or that you've never seen. Um, and, but the static analyzers can, can handle this and, and should. I, I really would like the guarantee that this doesn't happen in my code. And what you do is you deal with uh, every object has one and only one um, owner. That means that we know who's in, who is supposed to do the deletes, the closings, or whatever you call them. And then there can be as many pointers as you like, as long as they are uh, not in the execution after where the owner uh, was. This is a fairly simple, simple model, and uh, it can be enforced. Here is an example. Um, I have a function here uh, that has a local variable, and I call g with the address of it. Um, and uh, g then stores it in a global. This has to be stopped. We have to analyze it and say that uh, it's not OK to take something that comes as an argument and store it in something global, because you don't know if it is valid after uh, you execute, you, you exit. Um, on the other hand, things that we get from, from pointers are actually uh, pretty uh, good because under this rule, they will be valid when they come into the function and they will be valid until we leave the function again because they came from outside the scope. And um, what do we got here? Remember containers, um, pointers or any, anything that points can be in containers. So I took here a vector of integers, rest with something, and that is okay. We create collections of pointers, iterators, wherever we call them, and give them to functions to be called. And then when the function comes back again, everything is fine because the fact that they, uh, the pointers were valid in the calling code, F here, means that it's valid in the called code. We're fine. We're not actually having to eliminate all kinds of uh, stuff. Uh, this, this works. On the other hand, it is not okay to return that rest because there are pointers to local elements in it that will go out of scope, that will become invalid 
when we uh, leave. Um, invalidation can be a, a serious problem, so we need to eliminate it. Sorry. Um, here we have a, a traditional vector use, pushback of nine. That can relocate all the elements. Fine, that's, uh, that's usually fine. But G uses it in a uh, not good way. It starts by grabbing a pointer to uh, the first element, an iterator to the first element. Then it calls the function that does the pushback. And then it tries to use the pointer it kept. I mean, this is the reason for using um, reserve and for using uh, linked, uh, linked uh, containers like a list, because things don't relocate. We can, however, detect uh, that this piece of code is bad. Um, it has been done. So what we actually do, we have the, uh, the idea of invalidated. Uh, when the pointer points to an element of a container that may have relocated the elements that called invalidated, it, it may or may not be valid. And uh, then we can uh, handle it by a fairly simple rule. Uh, and no, uh, a, a const member function uh, doesn't invalidate because it would have to do something nasty to the const. It would have to use a, um, a cast or something like that. So also it's easily validated by a, uh, an analyzer. On the other hand, we must assume that any um, non-const member function could invalidate. It has access to the data and it can, it can, it can, it can relocate. It can, it can move things around. Um, I would think that we need a new uh, annotation in the core guidelines and in uh, the profiles, which basically says, yeah, this one doesn't invalidate even though it is non-const. Standard example, vector operator subscript, it doesn't relocate, um, but it can't be const. So uh, it's also easily validated, so that is a provable thing, so it is perfectly safe and easy to do. So uh, represent ownership. We use ownership abstractions as usual. Stay high level. Don't mess with the low level things if you don't. But we always have to consider how do we deal with code that's not written according to our rules? Like, thing that, like code that has C style interfaces with lots of pointers in them. And so we have an annotation in the uh, core guidelines primarily to deal with the fact that the world isn't that simple and we don't own it all. Um, and that's called owner. I can say this pointer is an owner. I'm passing it over to you and I know it's your job to delete this thing. It can be done. Um, so basically there's been a fair amount of work done with this. Um, and there's some rules about how you can copy owners and, and not. They, they, you can deduce them from what is safe, so I'm not going to go through them here. If you're looking at the slides, or, uh, you, know, you can freeze this and see what this is. So now I want to get to uh, future stuff. Where do we go to here? Uh, we can write good C++. I hope I uh, made a reasonable argument for that. And too many developers don't. Uh, they write uh, C slash C++, this mythical language. Uh, guidelines are not enough. We need guarantees, uh, partly because we make mistakes and uh, partly because we are more comfortable if we have a real proof. And uh, we, we, we need new standards for what the static analyzers, what the compilers analyze. And so we have some alternatives of how we can proceed from here to get the guarantees. We, we can change C++. Uh, we can start using another language, which is, of course, what proponents of all other new languages are suggesting. And we can enforce a variety of guidelines. Um, that's the profiles I'm arguing for. So fixing C++, how? There is so many different uh, and incompatible ideas about how to change uh, C++. And to change C++ in ways that addresses the problems I've been talking about. So 
it will not look like C++, and there are uh, several suggestions, so we have years of delay and chaos. And a single cleanup language will provide a single kind of safety, unless, of course, it adopts the profile approach. And uh, that, that would not be what a lot of people uh, talk about. And a cleanup C++ will have to interoperate with classical C++ code forever. That is just a, just a fact, as these billions of lines of code are not going to disappear. And much of it is critical, and much of it is really high quality. So gradual adoption is essential, partial adoption is essential. Um, and, well, for C++, I have had, it's meant to evolve, but also meant to evolve in a reasonable, compatible way. If you, had to, if you accept that last statement, it won't, won't be a, uh, fixed in the way uh, people uh, talk about. And then we can try using another language. Uh, safety is used as an argument, uh, often C slash C++, and very typically ignoring C++'s strength, and very often uh, ignoring the weaknesses of alternatives. Um, often the safety mentions is just memory safety. Uh, that's not enough. And uh, the need for unsafe constructs is not uh, heavily featured. And the need to interoperate with other languages, including C++ and C, uh, tend not to be mentioned. And the cost of conversion can be ferocious. Uh, that's rarely mentioned. And of course, this is natural. This is human nature. You, you, you argue for your case and uh, you overestimate the virtues of what you have and underestimate the uh, strength of the opposition. But still, we have to be more serious about how we um, have these arguments and we need to get some numbers. And anyway, which other language? Uh, the way I have seen it argued, we were about going to have C++ replaced by about seven different languages as of suggestions of about now. By the time it happens, 40 years from now, uh, we'll probably have 20 different ones and they have to interoperate. This is going to be difficult. Anyway, let's look. There's new languages, uh, new resources, new uh, expert users. Every new language, of course, is claimed to be simpler, cleaner, safer, and more productive than C++. On the other hand, we heard that one from Java at the time. I said, yeah, if it survives, it'll become three times bigger and be better for it. I was right about that. Uh, you can apply that argument to most uh, new languages. And uh, often the claim superiority is in a limited domain. And again, often compared to C slash uh, C++. And one thing I have noticed, when you have a new language, this happened with C++ also, you get a bunch of enthusiasts writing code. They are just much better than average. They are much more enthusiastic. They are better informed. Uh, they know all the latest stuff. And then you come up against the law of large numbers. When you have a language that is used at a large scale, your developers are average uh, quality, average enthusiasm, etc. cetera. Um, which means that numbers comparing a small new community with a large older community is going to be skewed. Um, let's see. Um, I was uh, thinking about what uh, it would take to convert something. So I said, consider converting a, a 10 million line system. There's lots of those. Uh, it needs high reliability and high performance because if it wasn't, why would you bother converting it for safety reasons and such? A good developer completes N lines of production quality code a day. I don't know what N is. It depends on what kind of code we're talking about. But for the kind of critical uh, software we're talking about now, maybe 5, 10, 100, let's say uh, 2,000 lines a year. That's not too far off. And let's assume that a 10 million line uh, system can be written in the new language, in the new way, from scratch, in 5 million lines, half the size. Um, this is sort of very optimistic, 
But if this is true, it'll take 500 developers five years to complete the new system. And the old system will have to be maintained by, uh, for, for those five years till you can replace it. And so what is the loaded salary of a good uh, developer? That's the cost of the salary, uh, pension funds, uh, buildings, uh, heating, cooling, computing, all of this kind of stuff. Let's say half a million in the US. It's not that far off. We can argue about 100,000 in each way, but it's thing. So it would cost um, roughly a billion uh, added cost over those uh, five years. And for one million, you can divide, for 100 million, you can multiply. Um, and I made the assumption of US developers, um, if you can find uh, developers with uh, relevant experience um, in the new language, that's uh, often a problem. And maybe outsourcing could cut cost. That doesn't always happen when you outsource. And the, it has its own problems, especially when, the, um, when you start talking security and such. It's, it, it, it's not obvious how can, you can cut that cost dramatically. But anyway, um, I, I said that I assumed the new system would half the size of the old one. It doesn't happen very, uh, very often, but it certainly is possible. If you have better understanding of the problem, better language, better tooling, et cetera, as such. And there will be no feature creep for five years. This is hard. And the new system would, be, would work and be delivered on time. Uh, what is going on with this stupid system? Oh, I see what went on with that system. I am not seeing what you are seeing. Now I am. Okay. Uh, so th there are, of course, people for whom a billion dollars or a hundred million dollars are not a lot of money. So let's not just dismiss the whole thing for that reason. Um, there's people who think that a 10 million uh, line system is medium. I did some asking around here. Um, and yeah, and so I think these kind of numbers are an argument for an incremental and evolutionary approach, uh, as opposed to just going to something uh, brand new. And obviously, that could be C++ or a combination of C++ and other languages that are able to interoperate smoothly with C++, and you can have a community of both things. I think it's better to stay with C++. Anyway. C++ will play a major role for decades to come, and we have to keep working on it. Standards Committee has to focus and make C++ better. And then I was um, looking up something I knew to find a, a quote. People like quotes. So there's something that's called Gal, uh, Gal's Law. A complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that worked. In other words, this idea of just building the new system over on the side without any of the problems of the old one is a fantasy. But it's a very popular fantasy. Um, I, I agree with that last statement down there. So profiles. How can we guarantee safety with standard C++? Code uh, guidelines are not enough. And the profile si uh, summary here um, is that Everything is ISO C++ standard. Um, the fundamental guarantees is up, uh, the most fundamental guarantee that we want is complete uh, type and resource safety. Ownership has to con uh, constitute a DAG, otherwise the, uh, the model breaks down. If you have uh, loops and such, you can handle loops with say shared pointers and weak pointers, but so easy proof, uh, stick to a DAG. Pointers dealt with, as I said before. Um, a gradual conversion uh, offering guarantees has to be supported. 
Uh, the set of guarantees are open. I do not know whatever everybody wants for guarantees. I can see somebody wanting an um, unsafe guarantee where they can use all of the unsafe features in the latest optimizer. Um, in, in other words, it's an open set. And we want some fundamental guarantees to be standard. I, I'm imagining uh, type and resource safety, memory safety, range safety, um, arithmetic safety, things like that could be standardized. Um, nothing's easy to standardize, but this is possible. And the set of guarantees is assumed are stated in code, otherwise we don't know which kind of analysis to apply to our code, and we don't know if we're users what kind of analysis the worst uh, applied for that code. And there's many notions of safety, I've said this before, but I think it's worth showing the, the list again, because people tend to forget it and focus on the thing that they are looking at just now in, in their everyday problems. Um, and here's the type and resource safety definition. Basically, every object is accessed according to the type with which it was defined. Boom, that's a nice one. And we don't have any, um, any leaks. And so, what about C slash C++? Well, it's not a language, but I think it's a style of usage that I happen not to like. It's probably also unavoidable because you have to call C libraries, and then we have to think about how to call things with other guarantees, the own annotation and not null uh, checking is examples of that. We can't just focus on making the, the, the new shiny version of everything. Um, it's too complex for static analysis. If we can write arbitrary code, we, we are up against dynamic linking, cost, and the holding problem. Um, arbitrary C++ focuses a deal with low level abstraction, so we have to raise the abstraction level to the point where analysis is possible and understanding by humans. And we care about performance and type and resource safety. So the idea is guarantees with static analysis have coding rules to make sure that the analysis is feasible and have libraries to make it uh, reasonable to, to write such code. And the profiles is a coherent set of guarantees, not just a set of unrelated tests. And a profile um, is then specified as a set of guarantees and then implemented with a set of rules that yields the uh, guarantee that we wanted. And um, I've had people saying, this is just too novel, it's too uh, complicated, it's too new. What we want is something simple and new, this shiny new language that you can define in 45 pages, just like uh, the first version of C. Um, I, I don't, don't believe so. Um, there's a vote there. You, you're always supposed to not do something new. You're supposed to just uh, put, put some kind of facade on something old. I don't believe this is feasible. I think we have to have an overall approach, a general approach. Each individual techniques and feature has been tried before many times, and that's good. But for specific tasks, and they are not, none of those solves all the problems. So a combined and coherent approach is necessary. And profiles has to go beyond guidelines because we want it validated. Uh, and we have to deal with, provide in, uh, code annotations. And we have to deal with mixing of uh, profiles, different sets of guarantees in a, in a large system. You can't imagine a million lines of code that all follows exactly the same rule. Uh, and if you can, I'll just up the number to 10 million. Uh, so we mix uh, profiles, and I think we have to find the tightest specification of when we uh, can use the non-validated, non-guaranteed features. We can't just say uh, th th this, these 100,000 lines are not checked. That's not good enough. It, it is good to have uh, maybe the implementation of the linked list, uh, two pages of code, have that uh, specified. 
So there's uh, some design work going here. Um, still under development, I'm suggesting uh, that you have module-based controls, uh, memory safety here, type safety is suggested, and encode controls, suppress type safety in this area, and enforce type safety in this area. I could have a piece of code that is just too complicated or too difficult to convert, so I can't do it. But I can say for this section here, I would like the analysis to be done. And suggest standard profiles, type safety, range, arithmetic uh, would be a good initial set. And uh, here's a summary of what it would take to do this in terms of uh, syntax. And uh, this is work in progress. There's papers written about it. And uh, you, you can go and look it up. There's also talks about it. And basically, no, we're not here yet. We've come a long, long way from classic C and from C with classes and from C++ 11. And we have to, first of all, get people who are not up to date with C++ uh, to become up to date. It does not mean using every new feature exclusively and using every, uh, every neat little new thing. No, it means uh, defining what you want and seeing the simplest way of getting it. The core guidelines are an attempt to that, and we need to start standardizing uh, profiles as described. And um, of course, this is something that uh, can't be done by uh, one or two people. Maybe it could in five years, but I don't think we have five years. So how can you help? Um, how do we uh, refine profiles? What profiles do we need? Uh, how do we best formalize the specification of a profile? And what can we do now? I'm dreaming of something like Profiles Lite that uh, provides most of the guarantee of a, a profile but can't do all the last things because, say, the static analyzer isn't up to it yet. And uh, what library components can we uh, simplify to use? I've been using a DIN array uh, that doesn't have pushback so that I can use it in a concurrent system without worrying that somebody does a pushback over on the other thread. Uh, maybe we need uh, more of that. And I'm setting up a GitHub for uh, uh, where people can put uh, suggestions and where I'm going to put my uh, drafts and such, such so that we can uh, create a community working on getting this kind of stuff done uh, in a reasonable time. Uh, the GitHub is not live, but should become live this afternoon. Okay, thank you. Do we have questions? Do we have time for questions or have I run over so badly that we can't? That's, if you have a question, please come up to the microphone. There's one over there also. Hey, thanks a lot. So you mentioned, uh, for example, a uh, vector without pushback in certain profiles. So, uh, do you think that a profile uh, will like, eliminate uh, member functions in some cases or just make those member functions behave differently? I don't quite understand the question, sorry. You mentioned that in a certain uh, context, you might want a vector class that doesn't have pushback. Yes. So there could be a profile that uh, like, eliminates certain member functions? Um, that's one way of doing it. That's not the way I imagined doing it because, well, I did it some other way. Uh, because I couldn't actually mess with our standard implementation of the, um, of, of the vector. So, for instance, my students get a range check vector. I can't. 
do that without messing uh, with the implementation, and there are several implementations, so I don't do that. Similarly, what I did in case of the uh, invalidation was I used another class which I called array, which I believe you can find in the GSL, which simply didn't have that uh, operation. That's the other way of doing it. And if you are not uh, the standards committee or a vendor of a standard library, that's the way you must do it. And so I did. Okay, question on uh, immutable data. You said prefer immutable data over mutable data. At the same time, famously, the string class in C++ is mutable. And I saw quite, you know, so, some discussion about immutable string class, but it didn't really catch on. Um, I hear a lot about immutable string classes, but, you know, I like uh, mut mutating some strings some of the time. And uh, I have not seen a coherent argument for why it's better to have it defaulted uh, immutable. What are the benefits? What are the problems? And in the absence of such a, a suggestion, we're not going to get one. Furthermore, there's so much code out there, so it would almost certainly be an example of a, a different thing um, that uh, was immutable. But somebody has to do a thorough, logical, and hopefully data argument for why immutable strings are good. Is it an issue of correctness? Is it an issue of performance? All of that, I haven't seen that kind of argument. Thank you. I noticed uh, a lot of the various suggestions you're making are enforced by static analyzers or other tooling separately from the compiler. One of the issues I've observed when setting up new C++ projects on my own or at work is getting additional tooling into the build chain, into the CI, takes effort and is not trivial effort at production scale. Do you have any suggestions on how to make that process easier, or how to make you know, tooling integration simpler? There, there are a couple of problems related to tool chains. And yes, it's hard to get something new into the tool change. And the usual problem with C++ is that we have many of something. We, we never just, it's not that C++ doesn't have a graphic system. It has many graphic systems. We have many build systems. We have uh, many static analyzing systems. Um, so what I am hoping is that the profiles will encourage people to have to, to build static analyzers that supports a specific profile and that the build system, the compilation system, sees that th this is required and uses the installed um, static analyzer. Now, a lot of what I'm doing can actually be put into the compiler itself because a compiler is a static analyzer and these days quite a sophisticated static, static analyzer. Uh, the, the simplest would be the uh, in, in, uh, no uninitialized data uh, rule, which they are already doing more complicated stuff to detect whether it's been an, uh, initialized or not. But I think the, the idea of profile annotations should help with that problem. So it seems that the new improvement on safety and C++ are adding or addition to the language, new annotations, new types. Do you think and there will be a time where the default is actually um, the safety ones, and the unsafety one, you actually need addition? Uh, if you want to maintain compatibility, you have to work through extensions. and so. You cannot effectively eliminate features from the language. We tried several times with deprecations and such, and even incompatible changes have caused a lot of grief. So I'm not going that way. What I actually am going for is to, to simplify the use of the language through the guidelines, and then 
if you follow the guidelines, you have a simpler language to deal with. You don't actually have to know uh, the uh, horrors of pointers to pointers to void, uh, because the analyzer will stop you from writing one. Um, and so, extend the language, make a, a simpler subset of the language that you can enforce. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, you briefly mentioned about uh, you wanted to add write-only when, when, when you were talking about const uh, as the language feature. Uh, you mentioned that it will create a better interface or something like that. So what were you thinking of a use case of write-only and then uh, is there alternative we can use or uh, yeah, anything about write-only? I'm afraid I didn't understand that. Oh, uh, so when you were mentioning about the const, you yeah. talked about read only and write only, and then it will it would have created a better interface if there was write only, like const. Um, the const example was just an example of how, from the very earliest days, um, we have uh, tried to create a, a safer language, a language where it's uh, harder to make mistakes and easier to understand. And I just threw in a historical fact that I didn't just actually have const, uh, which is read-only. Uh, I also had write-only, but uh, I couldn't get it. Oh, OK. All right, thank you. Hello. Um, so do you think, um, like, sometimes you might want to ex express that the function is thread safe? or that it does I.O. operations, you think maybe under the, the hood uh, you could use tag dispatching uh, to implement the, the profile you were talking about? Um, I have not thought about this, so this is an off-the-cuff uh, comment. But yes, I could imagine there being a, a thread-safe annotation that, would, that may be part of a profile. Uh, profiles will invariably partly be built out of other profiles. Currently in the, um, in the core guidelines, we have um, memory safety and type safety, and I think there's three of them that would add up to type and resource safety. And I would imagine that a thread safe um, thread would be part of a profile. What I really would not like to see is a total sort of 50 or 100 things you can request because then you got chaos. And if you go and see the current static analyzers, they are very prone to giving you a free choice. And that very often doesn't add up to a coherent set. So of mean, guarantees. So, yes, th th it would be a candidate for something, but I'm not quite sure what. Do you think that if we had uh, compile time reflection as part of the language, we would be able to implement most of the static analysis checks by using concepts or uh, contextual functions instead of uh, external uh, analyzers? No, I don't think so. It's, uh, it addresses, I would like to see static reflection, but I think it addresses different uh, sets of problems. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, I think there is a good example when you're in a controlled environment, when you are the author of the code. But what, if, how, what do you think, how you can improve the safety when you're dealing with the libraries that, you know, C, C++ libraries? that passing you pointers, what that, can be done? Then? That is the problem which I refer to as mixing profiles. You can, you can annotate the import or the include um, with something about what assumptions you may make about uh, what you're importing. And that's about all you can do. You can handle subsetting of profiles arbitrary 
you can subsetting and disjoint. What sort of arbitrary sets of guarantees are just too hard to um, mechanically deal with. And so we'll have to have some annotations and have some humans uh, actually uh, try and understand and see what they're dealing with. Okay. And the problem will not go away. Yeah. For decades. Basically, if you have ranges, you... Yeah. It's, okay. we, you, you, we have to know it's a problem. We have to try and deal with it as best we can, but we can't eliminate it. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I noticed that you mentioned concept in your talk, and uh, we try to use it in our libraries at work. Um, I guess the problem we have is that it's making the code become more complex and understanding for other people when they try to maintain a library. And we haven't found any actual benefit of using concept. Um, so I wonder if you can elaborate on the benefits of it and um, some resource for guidelines to use it correctly. Sure. I mean, I have used it successfully in code that are not sort of uh, computer science especially uh, communication software. And we found it uh, very helpful. Uh, one thing to avoid is people using requires clauses as um, requires requires and sort of low level uses of guarantees. That creates a filthy mess. I don't know if that's what you did, but that's one thing I have seen uh, failing. People think they're using uh, modules, they are not. They're using the assembly code for creating modules. And, well, it's as successful as assembler. Um, and it takes some experience to build proper concepts. Um, I've seen people try and build concepts on the idea that they have to be the absolute minimal constraints for everything. Uh, again, you get far too many concepts and you can't remember them. Um, when I write about concepts, speaks about concepts, I say concepts has to be designed to, um, to, to encourage com uh, composition. That is, they have to be sufficiently high level that a concept can be used in many places and many algorithms. So if people build a, um, a less than concept and somebody else uses a less than or equals concept, you're on the way to something chaotic. Whereas if you build a um, ordering concept, as there is in the standard, uh, then with all the four operations, uh, you're, you're on the way to something better. Uh, I mean, it may be that your problem area has something that we haven't addressed, uh, but in most cases I have seen problems like that. It has been, been uh, immaturity of, uh, of use. It's like when, when people start writing code, they don't write good code. Uh, they, they, they make beginner's mistakes. And I hope you don't think I'm rude when I suggest that that might be a possibility. Um, if you analyze your stuff and see if you can be precise about what it was that didn't seem to work. Uh, I would like to hear about it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I think this is it. Thank you.